John Newton, as he mentioned, was a slave trader. What a terrible profession, right? Now, I don't want you to be deceived. There are still slave traders in the world today. Uh, and back, <clears throat> back in his day, he was captaining ships or running ships <clears throat> and taking slaves from Africa to the United States, uh, or to England, I believe it was, right? And not, not a very noble thing to do, we would agree. Not a very noble profession, not a very holy one. He had been raised in the faith, and he knew better, and he talked about it, and he was reading a book on a slave <clears throat> ship. Actually, he was being rescued kind of from an operation. He was on his way back to England, and he gave his life to the Lord right there on that boat. Do I have the story right? And I wanted to tell you that story because John Newton knows something about being a wretch. You know, you look at that first stanza, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And, and I think if you don't know the story, you might be tempted to think, well, this guy wrote a whole bunch of hymns. This guy was a pastor in England. He was, he was an official in the church. He was no wretch. He was. He knew a lot about being a wretch. He was not just a slave trader. He was a spiritual slave. John Newton was a spiritual slave and a physical slave trader, and God forgave him and made him a son. Amazing grace indeed. So I'm happy they chose that song. It leads us right into our text this morning, Romans 8, of course. We'll be starting in verse 12. Starting in verse 12, and, and I, hope, I hope that I say this phrase so many times this week that you almost <clears throat> are tempted to be tired of it until you think about what it means, but here it is. I have good news for you. <clears throat> That's the phrase. I, I have good news for you. And that good news is you're not slaves if you're in Christ. You're sons. Amen. You're not slaves. You're sons. Uh, so if you have your outline in front of you, which I know some of you do, that is the first point. Very, very simply, in Christ, we're not slaves, but sons. But sons. And it, don't worry, if you're a lady here, daughters, daughters too. It's like in Spanish, when, um, when you want to say the word for boys and girls, you just say boys in Spanish. And it's the same way in the Greek. Uh, you would say hijos in Spanish, which just means children, really. It's the word for boy. Any plural, they just make it masculine. It's the same way in Greek. So when, when Paul's talking about sons, what he actually does mean is sons and daughters. Right? So don't, don't think he's being sexist here. He's including you in the family, ladies. Uh, sons and daughters of Christ. So listen, if you're in Christ, you're not slaves, but you are a son or a daughter. And that comes right out of our text. So let's read it, and then we'll pray together. So then, brothers, we are not debtors we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, you have heard the songs of your people. You've heard the prayers of your people. You've heard the word that came forth from your own mouth. And now you put it into mine, and Lord, I pray that you would bless that. Pray that you, pray that you would move me out of the way. And you would make much of yourself, make much of the gospel, make much of your son here in this space tonight. Pray you would assure us with the reality that we are children of the Most High God. Help us to rest, help us to trust, help us to love you like you loved us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the very first thing, friends, we are not debtors to the flesh any longer. We are no longer debtors to the flesh. If, if I'm in youth, I'm in youth mode, it's Sunday night, so we usually have youth upstairs at 6.30. Well, I say 6.30, which the reason I say that is so they'll show up by about 6.45 or so. Um, so at 6.30, we uh, have youth, right, guys? Amen. Yeah, right at 6.30. Uh, what I would normally do is I'd stop and I'd say, what is a debtor? Right? If it's a word that I'm not entirely sure they would understand, uh, I, would, I would throw that out. So why don't I do the same to you? What's a debtor? 
Someone who owes. Can you, who wants to be honest? Is anyone in this room a debtor? I am. Student loans. All right. Looking forward to the year 2087 when I pay off my student loans. I'm just kidding. I don't know that much, but I do know a little bit about what it is to be a debtor. I owe uh, the government for those. I, I owe a couple other little things, but not a whole lot. But listen, before you came to faith in Christ, you owed everything to the flesh, to your sin, to yourself. You, you couldn't break those chains. You were bound. You were by default headed in the wrong direction, away from God. But now there is therefore no condemnation Amen. for those who are in Christ. We can live free from our flesh. Does that mean we live outside of our flesh? No. We're still bound to what we learned this morning, that we're still going to have to deal with the reality that our bodies are headed toward death, and we will still struggle with sin. But you do not have to be a slave to that sin. And here is the answer, the Spirit. The Spirit is the answer on the basis of Christ. So I want you to hear some good news right off the bat. You do not have to be consumed by a, spirit, by a carnal mindset. And I'm going to say, I'm going to rephrase that. I do not have to be enslaved to a carnal mindset because I struggle the same ways that you do. Even Pastor Ken struggles the same ways that you do. John Newton struggled in different ways, but really the same way that we all do. We, we apart from Christ, are spiritual slaves. Actually, even more than that, the Bible would be really clear and say that we are not just spiritual slaves apart from Christ, we're spiritually dead apart from Christ. If you were to look at Ephesians chapter 2, you would notice, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once walked in the passions of our flesh. That sounds like bad news. Dead? Spiritually dead? If you need an illustration for that, you could turn on your TV tonight at about 9 o'clock to AMC. It's a very popular show. I'll leave it to your interpretation whether I watch it or not, but it's called The Walking Dead. Have you heard, at least, have you heard of it? You know what it's about? Zombies. That's what it's about. It's about zombies. Now, they never say the word zombies, but it's people who have been infected by a virus. They are dead, and they're walking the earth. That, I hope, can be a pretty convincing picture of what it is spiritually to be apart from Christ. The walking dead. You don't even know it until you meet him. Does anyone else's story sound a little bit like that? You didn't even know you were, what, is it, what does the hymn say? Sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Yeah? Is that anyone's story in here? To be honest, I, I'm sure it was my story, but I was so young when I came to faith that I don't really remember those days, and I praise God for that, but some of you, some of you have a past. And you know we praise God for that because you remember where you were when Jesus came and got you. And that's good news. He delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you to the kingdom of light. We owe the flesh nothing. See, Paul understands here that the flesh is a relentless enemy. It's like playing tennis against a wall. It's just going to keep return and serve. It's a relentless enemy, but he wants to encourage the Romans. They're not obligated to live the old life. I want to read you a couple lines from a hymn. I'm all over the hymns tonight, guys. You should be very proud. <laughs> this is Charles Wesley. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. What does he say? He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest John Newtonist clean. His blood availed for me. You don't have to live that way. Wait. If you're not in Christ, you actually do have to live that way. But if you're in Christ, you don't. Jesus' blood is availed for you. Outside of Christ, we're dead in our sins, but in Christ, we're alive, and we can live like it. 
we can live like it. I don't want to just leave you dangling with the bad news. Verse 4 of Ephesians 2 goes on to say, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. I have good news for you. There it was. Jesus makes us alive. We are now free to live by the Spirit. We're now free to live by the Spirit. Look with me at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. How about those words? Strong. If you live by the flesh, you're headed in a bad direction. You will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So we have an interesting paradox here. A really interesting paradox because verse 12 makes it clear we actually are debtors. We're not debtors anymore to the flesh, but we do owe a debt, and it's to the Spirit. But, verse 13 seems to make it seem like, like we're free. So it's an interesting grace paradox here that being in Christ, being made new in Christ, it, it sets you free to be bound to Christ, to live by the Spirit. It sets you free so that you can live by the Spirit, because if you aren't in Christ, you can't. Does that make sense? I know we're uncomfortable with paradox here in the, in, in the United States for sure, but there is one. In Christ, you're free, and you're bound to Christ. But the good news is, he's no slave master. He's no tyrant. He's no bully. He's a loving, kind, gracious, older brother, and we through him, have access to the perfect Father. Don't let me get ahead of myself. I'll get there. Let me show you this out of 1 Corinthians. You can turn with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to show you just a little bit how we are actually indebted to God for our salvation. Look at this. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I've got to be honest with you. Uh, I'll try to do this well. It kind of reminds me of marriage a little bit. So, so when you become united with your spouse, you suddenly have some freedoms. You suddenly can do some things that are okay now that didn't used to be okay. And friends, let me tell you, that's good news. But you are not your own. You don't just belong to yourself. You belong to someone else. You've entered into a covenant here. You understand? So when we come to faith in Christ, we belong to him. So we experience things we would absolutely never have the opportunity to experience. Great and wonderful and marvelous things and we have a responsibility to be tied to Christ. He owns us. And that is the best news in the universe. Because if Jesus just saved me and then left it up to me to maintain that, here's what I can tell you for a fact. I'll wreck that. If I'm driving the boat, it's crashing. So it's good that I'm tied to Christ. Amen? Amen? It's good that you live by the Spirit. It's good that we're bound to Him. We are not debtors to the flesh. We are debtors to the Spirit who has set us free to live for Christ. See, the world doesn't believe this, and they don't want to tell you this, but true freedom is found in the Spirit-filled life. True freedom is found in the Spirit-filled life. We can live free from sin because we belong to God. We can live free because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are children of God. And that's good news. Look at verse 14. We're children of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay, we, we heard this a little bit this morning, but I want to recap. As children of God, we receive a new spirit. We receive a new spirit. Do you remember Caleb from this morning? He had a spirit that was different from the other Israelites that went to spy out the camp. 
We, we receive a new spirit. And, and the Bible is, is, is really, really clear in verse 15. Look at it. You didn't receive the spirit of slavery, no, to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons. That's the spirit we have. That's the new spirit that God gives us because of our relationship with Christ through the spirit. We get a spirit not of spiritual slavery, not of fearful slavery. That's not our spirit at all. See, all slavery is built on fear, right? All slavery is built on a foundation of fear. Who chooses to be a slave? No one. No one chooses to be a slave. A slave is a slave because they are terrified to try to be free. That's the essence of slavery. It's built on fear. And I want to tell you the truth. Spiritual slavery is built on fear as well. Let me try to help you understand that. I, I'm sure there's more, but I want to give you two fears that lead us into spiritual, spiritual slavery. You ready? The first one is the fear of missing out. The fear of missing out. If you were to really dive deep into a conversation with a millennial or someone my age or younger, I think you would find that this is a core fear that they have. This is why we have to have seen all of the pictures and all of the videos on Facebook or Instagram or whatever the social media platform du jour is. We are terrified of missing out. And you know what I think keeps a lot of people from coming to faith in Christ? Fear of missing out on all that the world has to offer. But if I give my life to the Lord, I'll have to I'll have to do this, or I'll have to give this up, or I won't get to experience this. And, and those things are real shiny. The things the world throws at us are really shiny. And they're really attractive. But ultimately, they leave us empty. I think you might have seen this in John chapter 15. The prodigal son, have you ever heard of him? He's a, he's a kid who has a rich dad and he goes to his dad and he wants to see what the world has to offer him. He says, Dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. So the dad gives it to him. And he runs off and he indulges in all the pleasure, the sinful pleasure in the world and he finds out something very specific. It isn't worth it. It's not worth it. So he had the fear of missing out, but I think he also had another fear. This other fear that I want to mention is fear of not measuring up. Why didn't he come home? Or why didn't he want to come home, rather? He was afraid of what was going to happen when he got there. I, know, I don't know about you. That dad really surprised me when I read the story the first time. If I had gone off and squandered my wealth, which I don't have, by the way, if I had gone off and lived like he lived, I would be just as afraid to come home to see my dad, Pastor Wes, But can I brag on him for a minute? I don't think she'd mind me telling you this. I have an older sister who went to lay down in the pigsty. She went to squander a lot of things. She was really afraid of missing out, and she wasted some years of her life. And I watched my dad over and over and over come running up the hill with his skirt, his tunic pulled up, ready to give her a hug, and ready to put her a ring on her finger and ready to kill the fatted calf for her. And it was a really good picture of what God's grace is like for those who are in spiritual slavery. So friends, before we judge, before we throw, ar <clears throat> throw arrows, when you know someone who is in spiritual slavery, maybe it is your kid, and maybe it's so frustrating and maybe they just make you furious I want you to remember there was a point in your life when you were a slave to but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved you made you alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved Amen. so the message that the slave needs is that there's a loving father who's ready to throw his arms around the son 
and give them a big kiss and throw them a big party. Does that mean we absolve sin? Obviously not. But it does mean we love those who are trapped, who are addicted, who are bound, who are hopeless. Our culture is afraid of missing out. They're afraid of not measuring up. That's what keeps a lot of people from faith, you know. Is this fear that if they were to come to church, they'd be judged. Or they just wouldn't be good enough. I hear it all the time. And it makes me sad because I actually know for sure that my church is not like that. I know that if they'd come here, we'd throw our arms around them and give them a hug as well. But somehow, some way, they've learned that the church will judge them. I know of a story of a friend of mine. He worked at Goodyear in Danville. He worked at the Goodyear plant. He had a friend he just kept inviting to church over and over. He kept inviting them all the time. Like every week, he was, he was relentless. And the dude just kept saying no every week. And, and my friend, uh, Drew is his name, he said, what's the issue? Why won't you come? Why won't you come? And he finally said, because I have too many tattoos. And it sounds kind of funny, but it just makes me mad. First off, I have two. But it just kind of makes me mad because he has learned somewhere along the way that God is really just concerned that you measure up to his standard and then he'll accept you and then his family will bring you into the table and they'll accept you as well. But let me tell you, you don't measure up. None of us do. We're all hopelessly lost outside of Christ. We are all walking dead. We are all spiritual slaves. And I know I'm preaching at the right crowd. I understand. I'm not mad at you. But maybe what we can do, church is turn the amps up to 11 on our declaration to the world that we accept you, we love you, we want you here. We love the spiritual slave. We love the one who is afraid. We love the one who doesn't think he measures up because we know we don't either. We don't either. So, we don't have a spirit of fearful slavery here. That's not what we get. Sons live under grace. They don't live under wrath. We know we've failed when we don't measure up. We know it. I know it. I don't think anybody in this room, despite some letters I might have read or emails I might have received, I don't think anyone in this room is more aware that I am imperfect than I am. With the possible exception of my wife. But even still, I'm aware. You're aware. You know it. You know you don't measure up. You know you've, your, only, your only hope is Christ. Your only hope is grace. So what is the spirit we get? It's a spirit of familial intimacy. We are adopted into God's family. Look back at 14 or 15 again. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So question, you ready to respond? What happens when you're adopted? Several things happen. I know maybe a couple of you in this room have been adopted. Most of you have not, but you know about it. What happens when you're adopted? You get new parents. Okay, what else? You get a new birth certificate, that's right. You get the privileges of your new parents, which... Truthfully, most of the time is, 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 a, is much better than the privileges you would have otherwise. What else? Hear one from you guys? You get all the rights as a natural child? I'll, I'll give you what I listed. You receive a new identity. You receive a new identity. When, so Carmen and I are in the process of adopting. We're very excited and we're just waiting any day. <laughs> just pray for us that our little baby will come home and we're so excited. And here's what's going to happen. Once we bring our child home, we are going to go to the social security office and we're going to change the number. Why? Because the agency told us to. But also we're going to rename the child. We're going to give him or her the name White. It's a boring name, but it's a name. (laughs) There's going to be a new little baby White running around And that baby is going to be part of our family 
even though they're not going to look like it at all, and I know you're going to love them very, very much. We receive a new identity as we're adopted. We also receive a new family. Amen. A new family. This is, you, can, you can extrapolate this out in any number of ways. In a physical adoption, you bring a child home, and suddenly it has a new mom and a new dad. Sometimes a new older brother or older sister. The Perkins are adopting right along with us. They're going to bring a baby home one day, Lord willing, that's going to have three older brothers. God bless that poor child. <laughs> right? We've already arranged the marriage and everything. Don't even try. We've got the dowry ready to go. <clears throat> you can talk about churches. When you become a believer, you were adopted into God's local family. You were adopted as part of the church. And then cosmically, you were adopted into God's very own family. You get a new family when you're adopted. You receive new rights. You receive new rights. One day, Lord willing, I'm going to have a child or two or ten or however many God sees fit to give us in our home. And I'm going to be on my deathbed one day. It could be at 40. Seems like a long time from now, but it's not. It could be at 90. And I'll have some document that will say that the $47.14 that I still have will go to my child. Or whatever. The reality is they're going to get my stuff. They're going to get all the things that I have. They have every right to everything in my home. One really good example, I was looking at this guitar earlier. You know me, I'm a guitar guy. That's a Gibson J45. That's from the 60s-ish, right? I actually have the same guitar, a Gibson J45 from 1969. I don't know if you can do just basic math or logic, but I wasn't alive back then, um, and I cannot afford to buy a Gibson J45 from 1969. Let me tell you, those things are nice. You know how I got it? My papa. He's a worship leader. I don't know if some of you didn't know that. He's a worship leader, and a couple years ago at Christmas, he said, hey, I want to give you your inheritance now. I said, I'm not no prodigal son. You don't have to do that. <clears throat> And he said, no, I want to because I want you, I want to see, I want to have joy in seeing you use it. And he gave me that guitar. That's why I sport it on my arm, by the way. Because it's special to me. I have every right to the things that belong to Tom White, my papa, and Wes White, my dad. And my kids are going to have every right to everything that belongs to Andrew White. Maybe even the Gibson. So when we're adopted, we receive new rights. And, and although it may not seem like it, here's one of the biggest blessings of being adopted. As children of God, we can call on him passionately and intimately. You see that phrase, by whom we cry, Abba, Father? There is much debate over that phrase. But here's where all of the scholars can actually agree. The only thing they know for sure and they argue a lot, is that it's a very intimate term. Jesus used it when he prayed to God, his Father, and, and there's not a whole lot of record of anybody using that phrase in prayer before Jesus did. That's, a, that's like a, that's like a, that's daddy. That's like a, just whatever you pet name your dad, that's that name. It's very intimate, it's very close, it's Jesus' favorite title. This is what F.F. Bruce says, said, when they address that they being Christians, address God by the same name as Jesus used, it's evident that the spirit that animated Jesus has taken up residence in their lives. You understand? When they use the same name that their older brother uses for dad, it's evidence that they're part of the family. They're part of the family. So I have to confess, I'm still working on this. I can see the smirk. It's already on her face. I have a hard time calling my mother-in-law mom. I'm trying. I did it the other day. Did you know? I hope you noticed, and I hope I get extra Christmas stuff. All right, so, no, just kidding. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> you know why it's hard? Because I, I have a mom, and she's awesome. But I'm also part of the Hunter family now, so, mom, I'm trying it. I'm doing my best, all right? I call her madre, which is Spanish for mom. It's close, right? I remember when I was in high school, I had a, my best friend, Chad. 
Um, there's three brothers, Chad, Tommy, and Jesse. Jesse is the missionary to Thailand that some of you know. Um, I would hang out at their house like every day. It was, it was that kind of friendship, right? I was there all the time. He was uh, there always at my house. In fact, Tommy, the middle one, even lived with my family for a little while once his family moved uh, to Georgia. So we were very, very close. And, and I developed a, uh, I started calling his mom, who's, whose name is D. I started calling her Mama D. Mama D. You know why? Because I'm the fourth Newton. I'm one of the brothers. I'm part of that family, and I can call her Mama D because I know that one day, if something terrible happened to my family, I'd have Mama D. Right? I know that if something happened to my parents, I've got some new ones here. Right? When we address God by the same title that Jesus uses, it tells us we're all part of the same big happy family. I knew I was family when I could call her Mama D. See, as children of God, we receive a new spirit, a family spirit, not a fearful spirit. And as children of God, we receive assurance from the Holy Spirit. We receive assurance from the Holy Spirit. Look at 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Let's pause there because there's a... there's. Something different coming at the end. The Spirit speaks this new reality of sonship into our hearts. See, deep down, if you are in Christ, deep down, even if you doubt, and friends, I want you to know it's okay to doubt. It's normal to doubt. I'm not sure that Pastor Ken has ever done it, but I do it. I saw something written today that no Christian should ever doubt, and I thought to myself, what kind of Christians do you know? It's okay to doubt, but deep down, if we're in Christ, deep down, we know. Why do we know that we belong to God? Because the Spirit tells us. The Spirit will give you assurance that you belong to Him. You belong to Him. Even when we fail, we know who we belong to. Even when we fail a lot of times, we know who we belong to. I want to read you this quote from Spurgeon. The believer, like a man on shipboard may fall again and again on the deck, but he will never fall overboard. I like that. You know what that tells me? I can make mistakes, and I'm going to. I can mess up, and I'm going to. I can fall down on the deck a lot of times, but if I'm in Christ, I'm never falling overboard. He's got me. He's got me secure, even when I make mistakes. So how can we be confident of this, that we're children of God? Well, some questions we asked ourselves this morning. Do you remember some diagnostic questions? Are you led by the Spirit? The Bible is very clear. If you're not led by the Spirit, you are not a son of God. Are you dominated by the Spirit rather than the flesh? By peace rather than fear? Are you experiencing intimacy with the Father? You're not perfect, but you're progressing. Do you love Him deeply? Now, I have to apologize. I know we're running a little bit late. You might not make it to your movie. I'm sorry. But I really want to pause, because I really have to say this. It's a little cultural caveat here for this text. You ready? You need to love God not for catharsis and not for cultural status. You hear me? Because I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned that there's a a lot of people who have an assurance, but it's not from the Spirit, it's from the flesh. Because I don't know if they really love God or if it just makes them feel good to be at church. I don't know if some people really love God or if they just make sure they're marking it off their checklist. I'm not too sure that the same people who use God's name for cultural advantage would still use his name if there were a gun to their head. So I want to be real clear. The Spirit absolutely will give you assurance that you belong to Christ. But only if you belong to Christ. Sometimes the flesh will give you a false assurance. And it takes the Spirit to search your heart. And it takes you asking the Lord 
to make heads or tails out of that. I can't do it for you. Sometimes I wish I could, but I can't. Pastor Ken can't do it for you. The deacons can't do it for you. Your wife can't even do it for you. But God does. Search my heart and know me. Psalm 139, tell me if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. The Holy Spirit does give you full assurance if you belong to Christ. God wants you to have real assurance. He does. So we can be confident of a few things really, really, really fast. We can be confident in our status as God's children. We can be confident in our status. We've just spoke of this. We can be confident of our reward as God's children. As God's heirs, we receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're heirs of God. We get his inheritance. He's never going to die, but we still get it. We get to live in heaven with him. We talked about that this morning. We receive new life in the spirit. We receive eternal life. And we can be confident of our future as God's children. And here's where it might seem like bad news. As Jesus' co-heirs, we can expect to suffer. We can expect it. Look at the very end of 17. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Every New Testament writer agrees. Not a single one of them shies away from the fact that if you are in Christ, you will suffer. And somewhere deep in the riches of God's knowledge, he's made this part of how his grace works, that suffering is the path that leads to glory. I can't tell you why, aside from maybe pointing you to 1 Corinthians 12, 9, that God's grace is made sufficient in your weakness. His strength is made perfect when you need him the most. He sometimes lets you hit rock bottom so that you can know he's the rock at the bottom. And we're going to deal with that a lot tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. But I want you to know we can be confident that suffering is the pathway to glory. We can be confident that God will pay us back for our suffering in glory. We can be confident that only by carrying the cross will we win the crown. Only by carrying the cross will we win the crown. So as Jesus is co-heirs, we can look forward to glory. Spending eternity with God, we get to experience his presence forever. And that makes any suffering we endure worthwhile. So can I ask you, if you're hurting in this room, if you're desperate to know why, why am I going through this? If, you're, if you spend time on your knees and, and, and you maybe soak your carpet with your tears at night, can I just ask you this? Will you please read the rest of Romans 8? And will you join us tomorrow night? Because verse 18 starts with a resounding promise. I consider that the present sufferings of this world are not worth comparing to the glory that is to come. Before we get there, please come back tomorrow night. Before we get there, I want to ask you some questions. Would you bow your head, close your eyes. The band can come on up. We'll be ready to close. There's a quote that goes like this. Sin abducts, God adopts. Sin makes slaves, God makes children. Choose the better portion. Sin brings death, life is found in Christ. Friends, if you don't know Christ, take heart, be encouraged. There's a way out of sin. You can be free. You can become a child of the living God and you can experience all the blessings that come with adoption into the heavenly family. Would you find your peace in Jesus? Now, I know this is a Sunday night crowd, so I want to address a majority of you. If you know Christ, take heart. Find peace in the Spirit's assurance that you are a child of God. Go and live like it. Keep killing your sin and keep communing with the Father. I want you to know, as we close, I want you to know that the only way to kill your sin is to drag it down to the old rugged cross. Amen. That's the only way. Mm -hmm. That's where grace is found. That's where hope is found. That's where life is found. And the blood of Christ and the indwelling of the Spirit according to the plan of the Father.